Good day, I'm Norman Wahlberger. Today we're going to talk about the difference between absolute and relative measurement, particularly in geometry. We have a chance to go back to some of the thinking of the ancient Greeks, but also to the forefront of moving ahead with geometry today. Okay, so the notions of absolute measurements and relative measurements are in fact very familiar to us from everyday life. And this is a well-known concept in everyday life. An absolute measurement is something like Fred is 190 centimeters tall. It involves a particular number and a certain amount of units measuring some particular quantity. And there's only one object involved, in this case Fred. We're just measuring Fred in an absolute sense. Or the book weighs one kilogram. We're just talking about one book and making a measurement about its weight. Or light takes eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. That's involving two objects, but we're really only measuring one quantity. Now, a relative measurement is where we have two kinds of similar things and we're comparing them, but we're not necessarily invoking any units. So, for example, Fred is twice as tall as Hilda. This is independent of whether we're measuring in centimeters or in inches, feet, meters, or some other system. Just the fact that Fred is twice as tall as Hilda is a relative measurement comparing Fred with Hilda. Or the book weighs one-third of the case. This statement doesn't tell us how much the book in the case weighs, just tells us the relationship between the two. And an octave represents a frequency ratio of two to one. You go from la, la, that's an octave. And the Pythagoreans realize that's related to the ratio of two to one of frequencies. So absolute measurements typically involve units. We have some choice of measuring yardstick for whatever we're measuring, whether it be length or weight or something else. While relative measurements are generally pure ratios or proportions, they're in some sense unitless quantities because the units, whatever we're using, sort of cancel out. So this twice here is a unitless thing, the one-third is unitless, the two to one is unitless. So these are very familiar kind of distinctions uh, between different ways of thinking about measuring in our ordinary world but they have a lot of applications to mathematics too and that's what we're going to be interested in today. The ancient Greeks, in particular the Pythagoreans, held proportions in high regard. For them the world was governed by ratios, perhaps more than by numbers. It was the ratios of things that were often the most interesting things for them. In geometry, a similar kind of approach applied the great mathematician Eudoxus, and then a little while later Euclid, laid out a theory of proportions, and this was written up in Book 5 of the Elements, which is one of the most important and historically influential books of the Elements. So the attitude to the Greek measurement was very different from ours today, something I've talked about at various times, and it's good to remind you that they thought in terms of segments in the plane, but they did not think in terms of measuring lengths. They did not think about having a ruler and applying a ruler to such situations to measure things. So for example, these days, if we were interested in the relationship between the segments A and B, we would be inclined to take a ruler and we would measure this one, say it's eight centimeters, and we would measure this one and it's 16 centimeters. And so we would say, aha, this one is twice as long as this one. But that's not the way the ancient Greeks uh, worked. Euclid had a serious reservation about using length. Because he was aware that when you work with lengths, you have to deal with irrational quantities. And in fact, the ancient Greeks didn't have a very good numerical system anyway. So how did they think about the relationship between these things? Well... Euclid thought in terms of motions, in terms of comparing this segment with this segment by moving this segment and comparing it. Now you may not actually have to move the segment. One way of doing that sort of indirectly would be to take a other piece, say this thing here, and we could record the segment 
A on it with these two strokes. Okay, and then we could go up here and sort of, if we do it careful, we can see that, aha, uh -huh, this segment B is in fact two copies of the segment A. Notice that we don't really need a ruler to do that. We just need a straight edge, which has the capability of being marked. So we can see with this method of using translations of a marked straight edge that the ratio of A to B, the proportion is one to two. Now how about this one here? It's a little bit more involved. This uh, segment C and this segment D. If we do the same for it, let's say there's our segment C. If we do the same thing to D over here, let me uh, mark that here. So there's our, our segment C translated there. But we see that there's something else left over, which is not going to be a multiple of C. So it's not the case here that C is a multiple of D. So what did the Greeks do in that situation? Well, they thought a little bit more deeply about things and they said, well, let's have a look at this segment D here. There's C in there, then we have this leftover piece. Let's have a look at the leftover piece, let's say which is uh, here, and let's compare it to C. In fact, they would have gone, all right? So if we look at that leftover piece, so that uh, goes in there once, and goes in there twice, and goes in there three times. Okay, let's say it goes in four times. So this little segment here is occurring four times here. Okay, but that means that since this was the same as this, in terms of this segment, this smaller segment here, we now see that C is four times that smaller segment, while D would be a total of five times that smaller segment because we had C fitting there. So C to D would be in the ratio of four to five. They would have been able to determine that by finding this smaller segment, which was commensurable with both segments. In other words, such that both segments were a multiple of that smaller one. So this is a very attractive theory. But the Greeks eventually realized that you had to go further than this. That it was necessary sometimes to compare segments which were not commensurable. For example, the side and the diagonal of a square. And they particularly Eudoxus, developed a more sophisticated sort of approach to proportions, which allowed one to work with more general lengths, even if they are, even if they are forming an incommensurable pair. So what ended up being crucial is that you can be able to say that if you have, say, E and F, E, F, those two segments, and G, H, those two segments, what does it mean to say that the proportion between E to F was the same as the proportion G to H? One way to say it would be to actually evaluate this as a proportion of integers, like 5 to 3, and then evaluate this one and show that it's the same proportion, 5 to 3. But if these were incommensurable, then you wouldn't be able to express the proportion as a proportion of integers. And so Eudoxus had to find some more indirect way of being able to assert that the proportion between these two was equal to the proportion between those two. And it was a very clever and uh, lovely way of uh, proceeding, which I'm not going to tell you about, but I have talked about that in some other videos. But nevertheless, it gives you an idea that the ancient Greeks had a a strong sense of the importance of thinking about proportions and moreover they were a little bit flexible that those proportions didn't have to be integer proportions. But they were able to do this without actually invoking a theory of irrational numbers. They knew that there were irrationalities floating around here but they didn't actually talk about irrational numbers as such. Because we have gone such a long ways from Euclid and the fact that Euclid is no longer studied in schools. It means that our understanding of the Greek point of view is uh, sadly diminished. In the 16th and 17th centuries for the European mathematicians, 
the situation was quite different. For them, the Greek translations that had come to them from Arabic translations were only a few centuries old, in the sense of having been around only relatively recently. And there was a lot of admiration and reverence, in fact, for the Greek way of thinking. So Euclid's theory of proportions, which includes Eudoxus incommensurability theory, was considered more solid than irrational numbers. Geometry was considered the bedrock of mathematics, while arithmetic was some kind of much more dubious uh, kind of creation whose, whose real structure was not really clarified. People were following the ancient Greeks and thinking that the basis of arithmetic was really geometry. If you wanted to establish arithmetical results, you had to do it through geometry. All right, so the situation is, uh, is quite different from what it is today, and so there's a lot of possibility for people to get confused. And a lot of confusion, still today, remarkably, is related to this diagram, which in fact befuddled the ancient Greeks. The Pythagoreans, remember, struggled mightily with the fact that they realized that if you take a unit square and you look at its diagonal, then that diagonal is incommensurable with the side. If you ask the question, what is the length of that side, or as the Greeks would have done, what is the proportion of this diagonal to this side, you cannot express that in terms of an integer proportion. That was a great shock to the ancient Greeks. It was also part of the reason why Euclid carefully avoided a theory of length in the elements. Euclid goes out of his way to not introduce explicit measurements, not to not introduce absolute measurements. And probably the main reason is exactly because of this diagram, because of the difficulty in saying precisely what the word length means, and in particular defining the length of this thing here. Now some students will be so used to equating this diagonal with its length that it's hard for them to accept that there's a distinction the diagonal itself is a line segment which exists independent of any measurement of it. The length of that line segment is just one possible thing that you might want to measure of that line segment. There might be lots of questions you can ask about the line segment and length would be one of them. The question, does the line segment have a length, has an answer, no. You cannot define the length of that line segment, not, at least not in the traditional way in terms of assigning to it a number. So for most of history, geometry was more solid than arithmetic. And curiously, in the last few centuries, the situation has been very much reversed. So that these days, we almost all think of geometry as being built up from algebra, which is quite reasonable, in fact, because it allows us to avoid some very serious problematic issues that were in Euclid but were perhaps not so visible. Okay. But it does uh, open up a whole can of worms that if we don't get our arithmetic very clearly understood, then we're going to have problems understanding geometry as well, very much the current situation. So today, there is a, a view that segments are essentially the same as their lengths. That these two notions are somehow intimately connected and if you have one then you have the other. Okay, but I'm trying to get you to realize is that the segments and their lengths are quite different things. In particular, if there are any GeoGebra developers watching, please abandon the labeling of segments by their lengths. When you construct a segment in GeoGebra, it is not necessary to immediately see its length. That's a secondary thing that should not be put sort of first and foremost when you're talking about a length. And in fact, if you're going to allow people to see lengths, you probably should also allow them to see quadrants too. All right, so this distinction between absolute and relative measurements that we have in ordinary life that we're very much aware of is reflected in a similar distinction in mathematics. The distinction between an absolute and a relative measurement turns out to be very, very important in mathematics. 
in a number of different ways. So our first example goes right back to the beginnings of this series, to our first few videos where we introduced natural numbers and the arithmetic with natural numbers, and then shortly afterwards we introduced integers. Natural numbers are very good examples of absolute kind of measurement. When we're counting the number of objects, one, two, three, four, five, we're making an absolute measurement. While integers are in fact relative measurements, or at least the way we define them they were. I remind you that when we introduced natural numbers, we did it in a reasonably naive way. We said that we had the number one, which was just a stroke on the page, and then the number two, and then the number three, and the number four, and so on. And a little while later, we introduced the Hindu Arabic numeral system for those numbers. When we talked about integers, we have to define what an integer is before we can do arithmetic with them. And you may remember that we defined integers in terms of natural numbers, but in terms of the relations between two natural numbers. So we considered something like the expression 4 less 1, which equals 5 less 2, which equals 9 less 6. So we introduce this expression with this new kind of symbol, and we had a rule that told us when one such expression equaled another such expression. The rule was that k less l is equal to m less n, precisely when k plus n equals l plus m. If all these four are natural numbers, then this is something that we can check because it only involves natural numbers and addition with them. So this is our notion of equality, so that 4 plus 2 is the same as 1 plus 5, so this expression and this expression are equal. And then we thought of this thing as actually the integer minus 3. So an integer was initially defined as a relative notion between two natural numbers. And this is reflected in the number line approach to numbers. There's the familiar number line, and there now is the point, which we call minus 3. But another way of thinking about minus 3, which is often involved in primary school, is to think about minus 3 as being a move to the left by exactly 3. So in other words, this sort of arrow that goes from 4 to 1 is another way of thinking about what minus 3 means. But in fact, there's a kind of a duality involved in the number line here, a possible source of confusion to a clever student. Because at the one point we're saying that the number 3 is that point, and then on other occasions we're thinking about the number 3 as being this motion to the left by 3, or if you like, this directed line segment. There's really kind of two different minus 3's floating around here. And we could get at that by giving them slightly different labels. So we could call this point the point minus 3 with a square bracket around it. In fact, that coincides with our notion of the idea of an affine one point. And we can think about this directed line segment from 4 to 1 as being round brackets with minus 3 in it, and think of it as being a vector. So the distinction between a point and a vector is occurring here in our interpretation of what minus 3 means. We have two different views, closely connected but subtly different. So another example of the difference between absolute and relative measurements has to do with these affine points that we've been talking about, which are in some sense absolute, while corresponding vector notions are relative. So let me describe that here. Here's the affine plane, which we're calling A2, with the familiar points, like that is the point 2, 1, call it capital A. There's the point B, which is 1, 3. Here's the point C, which is minus 1, 0, and the point D, which is minus 2, 2. So here, the points themselves are actual exact objects. They are given by these expressions here. We're thinking of them as sort of absolute kinds of things.
But associated to these affine points, we can also talk about the relationship between two of them, or the directed line segment between two of them, which we like to call a vector. So this vector v, which goes from b to a, we can write it like that with the arrow, and we can express it as the vector v, which is 1 minus 2 in round brackets, expressing the fact that to go from here to here, we have to go 1 over in the x direction and down 2 in the y direction. Now this vector is a relative notion between b and a. It's not so much an absolute notion, it's a relative thing. It's comparing b and a in some way. Over here, d and c are related by the same kind of relation as b and a are. So this vector here is also some kind of relative measurement of d and c. It's telling us something about the relative positions of d and c, but not absolutely where they are. So with this vector idea, we can say that the relationship between b and a positionally, is the same as the relationship between D and C, even though the positions of them are quite different. They're both expressed by this vector V, which is 1 minus 2. So we can write V equals both BA and DC. So we have two actually different kinds of, sort of objects floating around here. We have points given by square brackets, and we have these vectors given by round brackets. And they are, in fact, different things. And it's useful to think about them having sort of a separate existence, even though they come from the same diagram. So we can think about having a vector plane, sort of a new kind of plane, which we're going to call V2, which is the vector plane, which consists of just the vectors themselves and not the points. So that the objects over here are only vectors, and they're always emanating from the origin. So the vector 1 minus 2 over here is this vector right here. Going to the point, the ordinary point 1 minus 2, but we now can think about this point as not being a point, but actually as being that vector. So in this situation, we would only use round brackets, and we would think about these round brackets as representing vectors emanating from the origin. So arithmetically it seems as if they're looking quite the same, but in fact they have quite different properties, this affine plane and the vector plane. In the affine plane there's really nothing special about the origin. It just happens to have special coordinates, but it's not really a special point. But over here the zero vector has very much a distinguished role. So in the vector plane, there really is a, an important sort of center right there. While in the affine plane, it's rather more translation invariant. Difference between an absolute kind of point of view and a relative point of view in some way. Now, good courses in geometry or linear algebra will distinguish between points and vectors. And it's very useful for students to um, make sure that they can keep these two notions separate, even though they're very closely connected. Vectors have an arithmetical structure that affine points don't have. Namely, they can be multiplied by a scalar and they can be added. So if we're working in this vector plane, V2, whose objects are all vectors, so here, for example, is the vector V, which is the vector 2, 1. Here's the vector W, which is minus 1, 1. Then what we can do is we can add those two vectors. We can add the vectors arithmetically just by adding the components. If we add 2, 1 and minus 1, 1, we get uh, 1 and 2. We get this vector here which we can call V plus W. And geometrically, this is the diagonal of a parallelogram that we form by taking the vectors V and W and creating the parallelogram. Another thing we can do is we can multiply. For example, we could take this vector W, which is minus 1, 1, we can multiply it by 3. That would give us the vector minus 3, 3, which is up here, just 3 times as long in the same direction. So once we have this addition and scalar multiplication, it's not too hard to define subtraction as well. We get a very rich kind of arithmetic, 
which is in some sense some kind of generalization of integer uh, or rational number arithmetic. So the properties of such a, an arithmetic vector is very uh, useful and it's in encoded in the more abstract definition of, of a vector space which plays a key role in, in linear algebra. So there's an arithmetical structure in this relative story of vectors which are ultimately defined in terms of relative positions of points which is not shared by the points themselves it doesn't really make sense to talk about the sum of two points in the plane or you know how to multiply a point by three but multiplying vector by three makes sense adding vectors does make sense so we saw in our last video that if we're working in the affine plane with an idea of trying to get length introduced that this notion of length of a line segment really only applies to very particular line segments which are in certain privileged directions. A typical line segment does not have a length. And I know this is disconcerting for, for many of you who are sort of used to all line segments having length. But with this notion of, of vectors and uh, this idea of relative measurement, we can get some kind of partial replacement for this difficulty. So we cannot generally measure lengths along the line y equals x, for example, in our affine plane. This familiar line here has the property that if we take the point, the origin, 0, 0, and the point, 1, 1, it does not make sense to talk about the length of that segment, because that goes back to that Pythagorean conundrum that we've talked about many times. So the length of OA is undefined. But Along this line, we can have a notion of relative lengths, or more precisely, relative sign lengths. Although we are not able to absolutely measure lengths, we are able to compare sign lengths here and here. Interesting situation where the absolute object doesn't exist, but a relative notion does exist. So let me explain that. Let's have a look at this situation here where we have the point O, the point A, and the point B, which is 9 quarters, 9 quarters. So it also lies on this line. If we think in terms of vectors, if we think of the vector OA and the vector AB, they are in the same direction. And so in this case, one of them is a multiple of the other. If we take this vector here and we ask what's the relationship between this vector, so this vector would be the vector uh, 5 quarters, 5 quarters. Well, this vector would be the vector 1, 1, with round brackets. Right. And then this is the vector 1, 1, and this is the vector 5 quarters, 5 quarters. Well, then this vector is just 5 quarters, that one. It's a multiple of this one. Or in proportion notation, the proportion between the vector OA and the vector AB is 4 to 5. It's 4 to 5. So we are able to talk about the relative side lengths along this line here. In fact, we're allowed to do that along any line. So if we're given any line, it makes sense to talk about relative sign lengths along that line, even though we're not able to talk about absolute lengths along a general line. That's a very interesting situation that uh, goes some way to alleviating this problem. Okay? That we have to move to a relative thinking about measurement if we're going to take some subspace of our affine space. So it turns out that this situation does generalize to areas and volumes, more precisely to signed areas and signed volumes. But to really express that in a good way, we have to kind of think about what two-dimensional analogs of vectors are, or what three-dimensional analogs of vectors are. This is a very subtle uh, issue that goes back to a, a brilliant but largely unrecognized German school teacher. I'm going to be talking about uh, Grassmann's uh, work in videos to come. But to give a, an orientation uh, towards that, I think 
it's going to be useful for me to provide a now a, a little bit of a discussion about how to think about geometry generally. Okay. We've been talking about various kinds of spaces. There's affine spaces and vector spaces, and earlier I was talking about projective spaces. I think it's kind of important that I give you kind of an overall vista of the kinds of spaces that are sort of fundamental for geometry, modern geometry in particular. And uh, so that, that'll be a good foundation for, for going further in our understanding of, of various constructions that we can do in higher dimensional spaces. So I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.